Good evening. Today is Monday, August 13th, 2018, and we're here for the Cabarrus County Board of Education business meeting. I'll call the meeting to order. Before we do the Pledge of Allegiance, um, I would like to welcome, uh, first of all, we have Kate Colbreth, our Teacher of the Year, joining the board as the teacher liaison. And I'd also like to thank uh, SRO uh, School Resource Officer Mark Drummond from Winecop Elementary for being here tonight. So please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Kirk, for representing us so well. Board members, we have the agenda. Uh, because the meeting minutes were not posted until today, the open session minutes, I'd like to move item 5.01 just down to the end of open session so we have a chance to uh, all read through those and then we won't delay other folks who are here for other parts of the agenda. So do I have a motion to approve with that change in the agenda? So moved. And I'll second that motion. Okay, so Dr. Kirk made the motion uh, and Mr. Shoemaker made the second. Any comments? Um, no, it would be to 9.06, just to, right before we go into closed session. That way we just want to hold up other people. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so that passes 6-0. We'll move into the recognitions. Oh, we have to approve oh. the agenda now. I'm sorry. I'll make a I, was, I was approving it with the amendment. I thought we were okay with that. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Shoemaker made the motion to approve the amended agenda in a second. Second. And Dr. Kirk with a second. All those in favor of approving the amended agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and that passes 6-0 as well. So we have recognitions. Uh, and the first up will be uh, Ms. Glenda Jones. All right, good evening. Welcome. Kate Colbreth, as you mentioned earlier, has joined us tonight as the board liaison, and I wanted to share a little information about Kate. She's a fifth grade English language arts teacher at Wolf Meadow Elementary School. She was named the 2018-19 Cabarrus County Schools Teacher of the Year in a ceremony on Thursday, April the 19th at the Cabarrus Arts Council's Davis Theater. Colbert began her teaching career with CCS in 2010 as a teacher at W.M. Irvin Elementary School. In 2014, she moved into a lead teacher role at that school, and she joined the Wolf Meadow Elementary School team in 2016. Last year, Colbert decided she missed being with her students daily, and she moved back into the classroom full time. Colbert earned a bachelor's degree in inclusive education and Spanish from Nazareth College of Rochester, a master's degree in reading from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and a graduate certificate in school leadership from Appalachian State University. In addition to her leadership in the classroom, Colbert has served as a PLC facilitator, school improvement team co-chair, lead mentor, and school improvement team grade level representative. At the district level, Colbert has served on the curriculum writing team and has presented multiple professional development workshops. And I'll just add there that she presented to our first year teachers to this morning and did an awesome job sharing the vision mission for Cabarrus County Schools. Wolf Meadow Elementary School principal Jennifer Brinson shared these thoughts about Colbert. Kate's most remarkable gift is her ability to balance the science of learning with the art of teaching. She creates classroom experiences and nurtures curiosity, thus allowing her students to become leaders, thinkers, and doers. She teaches her students to set goals, work hard, and celebrate success. Her work is not to impart knowledge, but rather to create the conditions in her classroom where students become inspired to think, grow, and learn. We would like to congratulate and welcome Kate Colbreth, our 2018-2019 Cabarrus County Schools Teacher of the Year. Kate will be serving as the teacher representative on the Cabarrus County Board of Education beginning this evening and continuing for the 2018-19 school year. So welcome, Kate.
Thank you. And we will call on you on occasion to share your thoughts. <laughs> uh, next for recognition, we will have uh, the Odyssey of the Mind State Champions, Dr. Mary Beth Roth. Good evening, board members. Um, at this time, we are going to have two recognitions. Um, the first team that we want to recognize was the North Carolina State Champion for Odyssey of the Mind. This team is from Winkler Middle School, and I'm going to call their names, and I'd like to have them come forward, please. Colin Sheets, Ashlyn Shivery, Trey Terzia, Matthew Thornton, Nicholas Tost, Lexi Waller, and advisor coach Eileen Seats. If any of those are present, would you please come forward? They're over here. I was looking this way. Come right here and stand here. And while we're organizing here, I just want to share that I am the parent of two Odyssey of the Mind alumni. Uh, who did it for a number of years, and it was a great experience, and I was always amazed at the final product when we went to the, the presentations mm -hmm. competitions. So, yes. Congratulations. We know how much hard work you put into Stay that. here. <laughs> Congratulations. What was the prompt? Do you remember? Uh, but did you, did you still do the balsa wood structure with the weight, or you know, you did a different part? Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. The second recognition that we have this evening is also from Winkler Middle School, and this team won the State National History Day um, Championship. So if these students and their advisor would please come forward, Gracelyn Donahue, Lindsay Cap, Maggie Louder, Bailey Mitchell, and advisor coach Michael Williams. Can we explain what the History Day is? Okay. <laughs> So the National Hymn for History Day competition is uh, an opportunity for students to research a historical topic. The theme last year was conflict and compromise in history. I knew they would know it. Uh, and so these guys chose uh, a, a local history topic. They researched Logan High School, uh, which was the uh, historically African-American high school in Concord um, that was closed in 1968. They can tell you all about it, but they, uh, in the process of their research, they interviewed folks that were graduates of Logan High School. They visited the sites. Um, they, they read documents. They were in the public library digging through the archives and the vaults in the public library here in Concord dug up the whole story, and then we invited the Logan community to come to Winkler, uh, and we hosted a reception for the, the graduates of the Logan community. And the Logan, we had probably 30 alumni from Logan that came out to meet the girls and, um, and view their project. And so they competed in College Park, Maryland uh, at the national competition. So just great job for them. Okay, and that's, we have a short recognition uh, area tonight because we're not back in school yet, but next month we'll be back with a full, full routine. Uh, the approval of minutes 5.01 was moved down to 9.06, so we will go on to uh, the reports section. And Ms. Carpenter, the Real School Gardens. And we have Ms. Cherico with us. And this is a very, very proud moment for me. And I'm going to turn it over to Edna. And, and she's going, well, you're going to 
tell them about Linda and everything, right? I will. I okay. Will. Thank you. I was supposed to be a trio tonight, so I apologize. We had a Target representative and Representative Linda Johnson, who both are at the last minute were unable to join me. Apparently, it's back to school season at the retail end of things. And Linda wanted me to let you know that um, she was deeply sorry. Her husband had a stroke two weeks ago, and she's needing to take care of him. So she will be back at a more opportune time when her primary job of being a caregiver um, subsides a bit. But he's in, in recovery, so she, he just needs a little more attention. So are we up? We are up. And down arrow. Okay. So once again, I'm Edna Chirico. I am not an educator, I'm going to tell you that up front, so I may not uh, be as astute with the education terms as all my esteemed colleagues on either side. So, um, I work with a national nonprofit that has spent the last 15 years working in a very proven environment around outdoor learning. So me personally, after two terms on the Mecklenburg County Commission, which is when I met Carolyn Carpenter, and then 25 years in the commercial real estate brokerage business, I felt a calling to come back and do something that made a difference in the areas where we have strong economic and academic gaps. So two years ago, I joined Real School Gardens, and tonight we're able to launch our partnership with A.T. Ellen and Bethel Elementary Schools. I want to share just a few slides so that we all are on the same page with what we do to support outdoor learning and then be available to answer any questions. Through this slide, you're going to learn a little bit about our core focus of academics <coughs> to be that tool, that additional resource for teachers in Title I schools to help move that academic needle through helping achieve experiences rather than having all the things in their lives that may not be the same experiences that we've had growing up. So let me show you the slides. This slide helps explain our nationally recognized five-step model. It's easy for me to share it in a little different venue as a non-educator. So think back for when you were in elementary school and when you had to learn concepts like geometry. I know from my personal experience, I spent a lot of time doing worksheet after worksheet, and it was hard to understand those concepts. In the outdoor learning environment, you would teach geometry through handing the students a tape measure, sending them outside to identify what a rectangle is in nature, really good use for school garden boxes and then teaching them the concept of geometry in a real and relevant way to their life. So that's kind of the difference that a lot of us have evolved into in the term experiential learning. We know that school leadership in Cabarrus County and most of the school systems around North Carolina incorporate a lot of experiential learning. And what we offer, as I mentioned, is another tool in those toolboxes that aligns with national research, highlighting two key indicators student, that lead to student success. And those indicators are teacher's effectiveness and student engagement. This is a summary of our last 15 years and the research that we verify through third party peer associates. Um, and in more detail, we are able to provide that if you, if you so desire. Now, so instead of the traditional four walls, an outdoor classroom looks like this. We work specifically with Title I students, many of whom have not had the life experiences that we have. Our economically challenged students and their families seldom have the resources or the transportation to attend those dynamic summer camps or science museums. They often don't experience our wonderful dynamic parks, and they seldom go outside. Now, the seldom go outside doesn't, isn't exclusive to Title I students. We know that we're dealing with a lot of screen time. A lot of it's really important to our educational uh, ex ex success, um, but some of it needs to be mitigated a little bit. So we create that memorable field trip, and it's an experience that we can create several times a week. So there's no cost to this type of a field trip. We directly align 
integrated academic standards with the goal of improved academic achievement. We train teachers through our two-year teaching coaching model that anything they teach inside can be taught outside. Science, language arts, math, they snuck in those other slides on me, and many other aspects that get integrated into our curriculum, including nutrition education, which I know is near and dear to Linda Johnson's heart, too, and working with the Dole Research Academy. These lessons are integrated and aligned with North Carolina Central Standards. All teachers at Bethel and A.T. Allen will be given passwords to have access to our online coaching center. And this is a center that not only has all that curriculum that we were talking about, but it also has essential best practices around taking students outside, classroom management, and maintaining the different aspects of the garden throughout the year. That maintaining of the different aspects of the garden includes a lot of community and parental engagement. So in addition to training and teaching teachers, a lot of the schools need to transition their agriculturally focused school garden into what we call outdoor learning laboratories. We have about 35 recommended outdoor learning laboratories to enhance that teaching experience. Some teachers just don't want to put their hands in the soil, and that's okay. They may want to engage with the weather station or the earth science station or various components that you see within this slide here. But what is really important and what we encourage and try to work with each school to achieve is that physical outdoor classroom, that seating area with the whiteboard where you can start and stop each outdoor lesson. <coughs> Forgive me, I am terribly out of order here. So we continually improve the third-party verification of the outcomes in each element of our programming. And those outcomes, which are being expanded this year to include some strategic evidence planning, they currently include the partner survey of teachers before and after the outdoor teaching experience, an integrated instructional plan with the school, a coaching rubric, and professional development surveys. So at the end of the school year, you as the leadership of the school will receive a comprehensive report on how all of the, both of the schools did, and then the principals will receive their individual report on their achievement in outdoor learning throughout this school year. Now we were originally just going to do A.T. Allen, but thanks to Linda Johnson, she was able to find some additional state funds to allow us to also do some professional development training at Bethel Elementary. So we're very excited about that. So with a school in Cabarrus City Schools and two schools here in Cabarrus County, we're now in three school districts. We're also in dialogue to be in about eight to ten school districts within about another calendar year, so the start of fiscal year 20. What's most important tonight is that you put on your calendars October the 10th at 9 a.m. at A.T. Allen because that is when our corporate partners from Target stores, they're one of our national sponsors, will have 30 to 35 of their employees at the school with all the materials and tools that they need to add about eight learning laboratories that are being fine-tuned and identified from those 35 that I mentioned by the school leadership at A.T. Allen. And in the course of about four to five hours, they will transform their wonderful garden boxes into an outdoor learning campus. So they'll have a wider variety of instructional opportunities at that school as we start their teacher training. And their teacher training will be, they chose to double it, so they're gonna do 12 teachers. Normally we do six teachers. We do a coaching model with them, with our lead instructional coach, and we have a bilingual coach that are coming to become the coaches for these two schools. And they will have four to six sessions with these teachers during their class time. And then they'll have a lot of time to plan with them, show them how to use the online coaching center. And at the end of this time period, this one school year, those teachers will become teacher leaders. 
And we have found that training 12 is a very sustainable model. About 97% of the 140 schools that we have been engaged with in eight states over 15 years are still engaged in outdoor learning and they're seeing their academic success add up as it's a cumulative process. The skills that the teachers learn during this coaching process for two years stays with them the rest of their lives. So without further ado, I'm going to get out of your way so you can go through the rest of your agenda unless you have some questions. And I do hope to see as many of you as possible the morning of October the 10th at A.T. Allen. Hopefully the target dog will show up. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I just really had the target dog. That's what I'm looking for, the target <laughs> dog and that day. <laughs> you don't know how excited I am about this. I have been working on this project or trying to get this off the ground for at least five years. And I am, <laughs> if I could do a cartwheel, I, know would do, I would do it at this point. I really would. I am so excited about this. Now, will we do any kind of thing at Bethel? Will we do any kind of uh, any kind of thing at Bethel? So you just have to give us a little bit of time. Now that Bethel's in the training program, my development director has them on the top of his list to find other corporate sponsors to help them do something similar at Bethel. So okay, just give so us a little time to do a little arm twisting with our corporate sponsors, and I'm sure we'll figure out by spring something. Okay, okay. We've got some national and statewide funders in process, so and we know. Well, can we put? Can we put Chuck's goat with the dog? Uh, <laughs> I, think I know that they were real excited when they saw the, the goats to start with because the uh, AT Gallon does have the goats. Uh, maybe we can get a picture of the goat and the dog. Uh, thank but you. Uh, I, I really thank you. And Crystal, for all the help, and the principal, Crystal, thank you for all that you have done to make this happen. I mean, this was just a joint effort on everybody's part. And I think it's going to be just wonderful with, uh, uh, I know I've been out to the facility a couple times, and I know the teachers that I've spoke with and the principal out there now are really excited about this. And I think it will be a wonderful opportunity. And I know a lot of the, uh, the first uh, presentation I saw on what was done out in Texas, uh, what they did with their numbers and everything out there was just, was just astronomical what they did, and I hope we can see that happen with us. Well, Mrs. Uh, Carpenter, I have to tell you, now I understand why you were so excited about this. Oh. So thank you for the lovely thank presentation. I had the chance to go through it before tonight. I um, appreciate it. Thank and you. I'm, I'm uh, anxious to, to see it. I'm hoping to get there to A.T. Allen for the, the project kickoff. Thank you so much. I, I did have a couple questions. Sure. Um, on the coaching center, uh -huh. Is that just strictly for the, um, the, the teachers themselves, or will the students have access to some aspect of that? It's designed as a, a curriculum guide, so they're all, um, there are videos that are embedded in that that they can show students, okay. but it really is a step-by-step -step series of curriculum and, and guidance for the teachers. So. But it is open to everyone, not just the six teachers or the 12 teachers. Every teacher or leadership person in each of those schools will have access if they so choose. That's great. And, and then you were talking about the third party verification of mm -hmm. outcomes. How does that, how does that, what does that look like? So our surveys and all of our research goes into Excel spreadsheets and online monkey survey and all of that information goes to peer associates, may go to Project Evident again this year. I, I haven't gotten an update from our national team on how all that's being structured. And then they assess the before and after picture and they provide um, that analysis. So it's not just us tooting our own horn. We have a third party verifying it as well. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing the start. And on the 10th, which mm -hmm. is a Wednesday, yes. will others be able to volunteer and assist to assist the target folks or is that strictly limited to the target? Now, because the targets have made a significant financial investment, they really control other than they always invite if you so choose to spend an hour or so and want a power tool, we're happy to, to accommodate that. But because it is kind of a pay-for-play model, uh, unless it's specifically being asked by the principal, it's part of their long-term community partners, which we will accommodate, 
or oftentimes the health department, if they want to be a participant, will let that happen. But other corporate volunteers, we ask them to invest. Okay. okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Doc, Dr. Kirk, any comments? I'm good. Thank okay. You. Mr. Walter? You, I mean, it's, you say the real school gardens, but then all these pictures and stuff seems a lot more than just gardens. It is. I mean, there's, you said 35 outdoor laboratories. And uh -huh. how do you, so eight, of, you said they're picking, putting eight at the school. How many of those are gardens and what are the other one, other things or we don't know yet? The other, well, now we have a, a lot of engagement time with the school. So they take a look at the 35 learning laboratories that we've built in other places around the country and they kind of choose what best aligns with their instructional plan for this year and what they feel that their teachers would most readily use. So they kind of choose which learning labs are going to be incorporated. You bring a very good point, and I could be getting a little bit of my national trouble right now because we're a little early, but you're going to see a rebrand in October the 10th, and we will no longer be Real School Gardens because that had a tendency to put us in an agricultural bucket, but we'll be rebranding to OutTeach. So some of the materials you saw a little bit of what that's going to look like. So the focus is on the core mission of new OutTeach being to support teachers in an outdoor experiential learning platform. And the gardens come along for a ride. Yeah. So there can be more than eight in the future? Or is it just Yes. Okay. You can build. Once this first phase is completed, mm -hmm. we hope to excite the teachers. Every month they get an email from us mentioning grants, some other ideas. They share best practices when they all the lead coordinators get together three times a year, which is the last slide here. Mm -hmm. And it's their garden, and we want them, their outdoor classroom, we want them to take ownership of it and to grow it so it becomes a very dynamic, integral part of their teaching environment. Yeah, okay. And this is a program for Title I schools, is that correct, or it could be any others? Yeah, um, sometimes if non-Title I schools want to participate, we ask them to participate plus. Participate plus support a Title I school. Because you know better than I that our non-Title I schools are able to engage parents and raise funds to a level that far surpasses our Title I schools. Sure. So nationally, we've made it our mission to support Title I schools. Okay. And is this, okay. I guess this is a crystal question, if, it, if it's successful with these schools, do we expand that to our other Title I schools or we don't Funding. know? Funding. <laughs> Come on. It's it depends, but that's a great question. Um, one thing that you will notice is the schools that we selected are Title I schools that don't already have a program. So right now, all of our other Title I schools have a program such as Balance Calendar, STEM, IB, um, Immersion. So A.T. Allen and Bethel were our two, Bethel's a new Title I school this year. Those were our two schools that did not already have a program, and they already had a gardening um, interest there. So um, I think the answer is it depends. Um, we certainly don't want to add um, real school to schools, real school gardens to schools that may not be interested, but I think we're definitely open to that. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, Mr. Powell, anything? Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Trico, and thank, thank you, Ms. Carpenter, you. for bringing this to us. That was one thing that I, I just wanted to add. That was one thing that was really important when myself and Edna were talking, it was important to have a principal that was enthusiastic about it because that made the program be, I think, would be successful if they were, in, they were enthusiastic about it. And we found both of those principals were really enthusiastic about it. And I want to thank everybody that was involved with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, for the next report, 6.02, we have a re realignment report. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Lynn Reimer will introduce our consultant on that project. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Board. Uh, Matthew Cropper of Cropper GIS will re <coughs> report tonight on the realignment committee's work. It will detail the work done to date as well as work that's still to be done uh, moving forward. The committee is still on track and focused with the latest school board decisions concerning the delays of West Cabarrus High School and Hickory Ridge Elementary. So I'll turn it over to Matthew. Yeah. And just uh, for board members, uh, as there may be questions on dates and timing, I kind of drafted a bit of a schedule for us after this. I'll send it out to you tonight for your thoughts uh, based on what he'll be presenting to us and where we go after this meeting. So welcome, Matthew. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Lauder. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and, uh, and speak to you. Um, 
My purpose of being here tonight is to provide a board with an update on the realignment committee's progress uh, up to date, and then also to give you a little bit of a glimpse and things that are still yet to come and looking forward and um, as, the, as the committee still continues um, their good work. Just a little bit of a background. Uh, we are here, um, and I am here, and the realignment committee is, 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 uh, is, in, is in progress because the school district is in the midst of a capital plan to add uh, capacity and support increasing enrollment across the county. Um, the following changes are being made to facilities uh, effective the 2020-21 school year, which is, the, which is what the committee is focused on. And this includes the new West Cabarrus High School, opens fall 2020, New Hickory Ridge Elementary School, uh, opening fall 2020, and then uh, vacating Beverly Hills Elementary School, effective fall 2020. Um, the committee uh, was, was focused on these particular uh, elements of the objectives in, in, in their work as, as, as late as the last committee meeting. So I can say that the committee is, is up to speed with the latest advancements and what the board, uh, the, the, what the board's decisions have, uh, how, how the board's decisions have evolved over the last uh, couple of months. Um, in addition to the new plan construction, there are current imbalances in building utilization across the district. So some schools are overcrowded and some have some excess space. And so uh, in, in addition to accounting for the new schools, we're also looking at seeing if there's any opportunity to balance utilization at schools, including the middle schools. Um, we're making changes to elementaries, we're making changes to high schools, but we may need to also make changes to middle schools to make sure that we align with the criteria um, that has been set forth uh, by, by the school board. So all of this uh, really requires a comprehensive look at attendance uh, boundaries and uh, how they are shaped. We were hired uh, to develop the supporting materials to facilitate this study, um, including development of a 10-year enrollment forecast. Um, we are facilitating a community-based process of developing a realignment plan as we are in the midst of right now and empower the community through this process. Um, the work doesn't only uh, end with committee. We, we really encourage transparency and openness in this process and uh, uh, allow the public to come observe committee meetings and also the public continues to provide input um, through different channels which we have been studying. And so the committee is really one part and the public is an extension of the committee's work and we're, we're listening to all of them. And then finally, we're here to leverage our expertise as professionals. Uh, we've done this a lot of districts across the county, uh, across the, the United States. And uh, we bring uh, a lot of uh, technology in to, so that the, this committee can make accurate and efficient decisions and be well informed um, and, and, and work with best practices. So I wanted to touch on the criteria because I always tell the committee they're considering a boundary change one way or the other. I always tell the committee and the public to, um, to think about things as it relates to the criteria. And the best plan is going to be one that adheres to these criteria as a whole, um, not focusing on one criteria, because if you focus solely on one element of the criteria, you start to deviate from the others. But, um, but the committee has been focused. I'm very proud of their work. And these are the criteria that they have been uh, focusing on. These are to balance school facility utilization, to account for future growth, and look at uh, not only look at where current kids currently live, but also where the future growth potential is of uh, residential housing in the county. Close proximity, so students should be assigned to a school closest to their home, if at all possible. Maximizing bus, e bus efficiencies and transportation of students, so uh, try, trying to make sure that transportation is, is as efficient as possible. Um, and that aligns also with proximity. Um, trying to get students as close to home as possible provides you some busing efficiency as well. Um, establish clear feeder patterns and continuity. So, so looking at the transition of a, of a school from elementary to middle and then middle to high school and making sure that um, we've, been give, we've been studying data that helps us with feeder patterns. It's the common term. Um, if an elementary school does get split to two middle schools, how many students are getting split and what's the percentage of that split? Um, we're, we're, we're really red flagging areas that have very small percentage splits. Uh, trying to have, if a school does need to be split, it's best to split it in half so that the students, when they go to the next level, they have uh, familiar faces and friends that they made at an earlier phases of their education. So um, trying, to, trying to have a feeder pattern, a good clean feeder pattern, is, is, is certainly something that we have been looking at and studying data on in, in addition to other, other statistics. 
allow for highest grade at school, uh, current school grandfathering. Now, this is more of a policy decision. It's not really something that the committee is focused on. Um, grandfathering is something that's really uh, decisions that are made at the level beyond the committee. And I tell the committee that, you know, uh, they talk about grandfathering from here to there, but it's really not something that they have the power or uh, it's the scope to, to, to make changes to. Um, and so, but the grandfathering policy that's in place by the school board is to allow for students who will be in the fifth or eighth grades in the first school year of realignment to stay at their current school. However, transportation will not be provided for these students. Uh, rising 12th graders must stay at their current school since there's not a senior class at the first year of West Cabarrus High School. And the committee is certainly aware of this and, um, and, and um, so that they're informed on this part. Another criteria is to minimize the impact on students. So and with any option that the committee is exploring, they're looking at how many students have been impacted, how many students are moving from school to school, and trying to look at the, the impacts and try to minimize that if possible. And then consider economic, cultural, and ethnic diversity. Um, we've been providing demographic statistics um, and information for their benefit so they could see what the impact would be on demographics with any particular option that's being, um, that's being considered. Make every effort to establish contiguous zones, so don't create uh, satellite areas and uh, say don't uh, skip over an attendance zone and, and assign a subdivision or um, a community to a school that's not connected to the main zone that the school uh, surrounds. Uh, and they have, not, they have not created any uh, contiguous zones as part of this process. It's something that they are focused on. And that aligns, again, with transportation and proximity as well. And then using major roads and natural boundaries wherever feasible to define attendance zones. So try to draw the lines along uh, uh, logical areas, major roads, uh, railroads and rivers, things that can be easily identified um, if you try to, to describe how a boundary is shaped verbally. Uh, you know, if you could do it, if you could say it verbally, then that's actually a, a pretty efficient zone that follows major roads and other things. But again, it's, uh, they, the committee tries to adhere to these criteria, if at all possible. Um, they're focused on all these criteria as a whole. And they're aware that, not, that in every scenario they look at, there's pros and cons. And there are some things where, where they feel like they wish they could make it better, but, um, but there, there is a cause and effect with any type of, uh, any type of boundary adjustment. But I'm really confident in their work and, uh, and proud of the work that they've done so far and uh, as far as they've come so far and um, with a focus on these criteria. So we, uh, I'm going to break this down into four phases uh, for the uh, student realignment project. We collected the data um, and continue to collect data. We're analyzing that information. Uh, putting together options with the, uh, uh, th with the committee and then also engaging the public through, a, through a, a, a structured process. So we collected information from the school district. Uh, we got student databases from the district so that we can map out every student and know where the students live. And then we can count students on any particular street. And that, um, that helps the committee be informed of how many students live in various areas if they were to move um, uh, communities uh, to one school or the other. City and county sources have been very useful, uh, addressing data, pr property lines. Um, they've also provided uh, ongoing future development data so we could see where, where future develop, uh, residential developments are being approved. And then the Census Bureau was helpful, has been helpful for, to, great, to look at the base population profiles, uh, which helped drive some of the population enrollment forecasting work. And then IRS is helpful for county level migration, which was more focused on the, uh, the demographic study, which prefaced the realignment work. But, um, but still, it's another data set that, the, that, um, that we had at our, have at our fingertips. Um, we put all this information together, as I said, a 10-year population enrollment study. And that information has been shared with the committee. Um, and that information is also available online uh, so that the public can, can, can observe. And, and read all, all the stuff that the committee is reading. Um, we took all this information, we put it into a mapping format so that we can align and, and overlay different, different elements of data and understand how they relate to each other, which we've been working through with, the, with this committee. Um, you'll probably hear, if you see emails, you get emails from your constituents, things about planning blocks. I, I live in planning block 77 whatever a planning block may be. Um, and in these planning blocks, basically, are, we take that mapping data that we, we geocode every student's address. And it, when we first do that, it shows up as a dot on the map. 
But in order to protect students' privacy and also to, um, to provide it more in aggregate form, we create what we call planning blocks. So each planning block um, has a count on it. It has a planning block ID number, and which the committee have been using and helping us reference areas so we can identify where they're talking about. And then also a count that shows the number of students that live in each planning block. And these are the students that go to Cabarrus County Schools. So the committee's aware, um, if, or the public is aware, if, if they're looking at some statistics on a utilization of a school, they're thinking, what if we move this planning block over here to this school? Well, that planning block may have uh, 38 kids, or it may have four kids. And they, they can understand what the impact would be if they move a planning block one way or the other. And this kind of empowers the committee to be able to do some homework with, with me not at, at the meeting, and also uh, the public, too, to understand various densities of, of students in different neighborhoods and, uh, and communities. I should say these planning blocks are, uh, they were developed by us in-house um, as a starting point, but the planning blocks are certainly able to be modified. Uh, we continue to get feedback from the public as it relates to planning blocks. Uh, most recently, there's one planning block that cuts off a street on one subdivision. It's incorporated into another subdivision that was unintentional. And these are, these are, these are adjustments that we can still make and that we, I'm certain that we will make uh, to help align with the overall criteria. So, um, so you no know, planning blocks are not set in stone. They can be modified or merged, or further divided if if we feel like the committee feels like it's going to bring them closer to adhering to the criteria. The committee member, members have been provided with a background report. It's basically a starting document that gives a lot of the uh, the baseline information, um, enrollment, capacities of buildings, um, a lot of statistics and data and maps for the committee's benefit. Um, and all this is, is, is available as well for the public. So anything that's shared with the committee has, has been made available to the public, which they can, um, they can download and, and review, which I'm, I know that they have. Uh, the public has been very helpful in providing input. Um, we have also created an online map that helps to further inform the committee and the public on the, uh, the work of the committee. Um, this online map is an interactive map that you can use from any device, a phone, or um, iPad or um, any, it's cross compatible, so you can use it on any particular device. And it's uh, croppermap.com slash Cabarrus. And this is, a, this is a good resource for understanding um, how the options differ and how different areas are, may be impacted. Um, and I could just, uh, if I could just maybe toggle to the website real quick to, to just give you a little quick preview on the interactive map. It uh, certainly could be useful for the board's benefit as well as the public to see how, how this site uh, works. So, so this is croppermap.com slash Cabarrus. And you'll notice when it pops up, you see just a map of the district. And if you click on the left, you'll see there's different layers that you can turn on and off. So um, one of the things, you know, the planning blocks are on here. We have different zoning districts and neighborhoods so that people can see where neighborhoods are. And then all of the different options that are being considered, the draft options, are, are posted on here. Um, the, the, the neat thing about this is you can just, uh, as you zoom in to this map, you can use the little plus arrow. Usually your mouse wheel would also work. But as you zoom into this map, you can see uh, different, different parts of the map start, uh, more detail starts to show up. So I'm going to zoom in a couple more clicks here. And you see more street labels start to show up. And if you get in close enough, you can see that uh, property lines start to show. So you can see actual parcels and how properties, uh, individual ownership properties uh, are, are aligned and, and how those are shaped. And the, the, real, the real benefit of this is I'm going to go out to the new school because I know that's an area that has been impacted, the new elementary here. So I'm going to zoom in over the new elementary school. And if you, if you look at this, you can turn on different options. So you can turn on option one. And you can see now there's a green zone around the Hickory Ridge Elementary School in option one. And you can see how, it, how it's shaped. You also notice the black outline on the map. That shows you what the current boundaries are. So you could see how the option deviates from the current boundaries um, and, and, and which areas may be impacted as, as, it, as it relates to this option. And you could toggle on the different options and see how they differ from, from, uh, from option to option. 
and zoom in and, 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 and look, at the, look at the communities and turn on the different options. You can see the colors will show you. And then there's also a legend down the bottom so that you could see how the legend, if you're having a question about what the colors mean. Uh, usually the colors re relate to, the, to whatever schools the zone, fault, the, the zone uh, envelops. Another thing that, uh, in addition to being able to view options, is this whole planning block um, component that I was talking about. And these are, if you turn on planning blocks, there's a plus sign here. You have to click on that. But if you click on the top one, it shows you a little pink outline start to show up. And you can look at labels uh, that turn on the, the planning block labels. We call them PB labels. And um, it'll take a second probably for that to, to, to refresh. But as when you when the when the the, the circle stops spinning, you can see it shows you the planning block uh, labels. And that's what the committee will say, uh, planning block 128, I really think it should go here or there. That helps me hone in on it. Or if public gives us input, I can identify exactly what area's concerns are. And then also the, uh, the, the K through fifth labels, is, that's the one that shows you the number of students that live in each planning block. Um, and we have the same for 6th through 8th and ninth through 12th grade students. So that's a really good resource for the public. I encourage the public to use this. Um, I use it all the time when I get emails and read uh, comments from the public. I go to the, to, to the areas of concern. Um, there's also a nice feature here, a, a, a Zoom to neighborhood um, community. So you can go look at the different, different neighborhoods. And it's a list of uh, neighborhoods that we have derived from the counties. Uh, databases um, from their subdivision data and the parcels and you can look at any particular subdivision in here um, I hope we hope that all of them are in here I haven't seen any that have not been in here yet but if not um, we'll certainly follow up but if you click on any particular subdivision on this um, it zooms to the area and it shows you this where the subdivision is located so you can see the outline of the subdivision and then um, and then you can look at that and then study their concerns and see how they're impacted toggling on the options and, and so on and so forth. So it's a really good use, really good resource for, uh, for myself, for the committee, and also for the public. And I encourage, uh, encourage them to, to use this. And as new options are explored and created and modified, this will continue to be updated uh, throughout the process. So we could go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. So um, we we created options to be, to begin the process uh, with the commit uh, for the committee. Um, we did this to, to really expedite the process and give them uh, help them hit the ground running. Um, sometimes with a county of this size, it's a very daunting task to, if they had a clean slate. And we, and I just get, said, okay, create some options for me. So th this helps to create uh, this creates different scenarios for them to react to. And the committee. Um, looked at these at the very onset of the process when we first uh, introduced these baseline options to them and they have made changes to them modified them throughout the process so um, so they were shared at the second meeting and they've had uh, two meetings after this and have continued to make adjustments to the options these options were developed with the, the criteria in mind um, knowing that they still needed work but uh, the committee has continued to, to, to benefit the process and giving us um, uh, modifications based on their uh, their local knowledge and uh, with a focus on the criteria. Public is a big part of this process, as I mentioned. Uh, it's, it can't be done without them. The way that we do this, and we really appreciate uh, the work of the public. Uh, in addition to the committee, public have been at all these meetings so far, um, giving us input and also providing uh, the most <laughs> most important part right now is to provide input via an online feedback form which we continue to get um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of emails are coming through on that through that channel. We put together a little bit about the committee. We put together a 28 person committee. Um, I collected all the applications that were provided to the county uh, to school district and actually mapped out all the applicants and the, the most important thing in this is that you have 28 members on a committee you don't want to have five members or six members all coming from the same street or the same neighborhood it's important to have geographic distribution and even distribution across the, the county of these committee members um, so if you look at them on a map the, the a good committee is one that almost looks like a grid pattern people coming from all different communities in parts of the county. 
And I can tell you that we, we did achieve this with, this with this committee. And every time I ask a question about a road in a, sp a specific part of the county or something about traffic, the com the, somebody always speaks up. Uh, well, I live over there. I go shopping over there. And so it's, the committee is really doing a good job in giving us that local input. Um, we selected them based on objectivity. We wanted to make sure that people encourage the committee to be as objective as possible, that geographic uh, proximity, and then also their ability, to, uh, ability to, to attend the meetings. And so I'm really happy with the committee that we have. They're a very productive, productive group. Um, looking at the timeline, you can see uh, where we are here. We're about halfway through the process, um, and uh, the committee has come a long way. Um, but there's still work to be done. Um, we're, like I said, we're only halfway through. Um, we've got four more committee meetings. We've been through four meetings, and we've co covered a lot of ground in the first four meetings. Um, our next, our next uh, engagement session is, is not actually with the committee, but it's with the public on, um, on August 28th, where we invite the public to come look at some draft maps that the committee has, uh, has feel are best, best adhere to the criteria at this point. They're still in sketch form. They, the committee knows that these maps still need to be uh, modified and that they're drafts, but they wanted, we wanted to provide an update to the public and get some uh, further input from the public. Um, I, Ms. Reimer mentioned earlier about in regards to the timeline of this process and if, if the latest advancements with the school board would have any impact on, on this process. And uh, I feel that this committee is right on track and, uh, and they are focused with... Uh, on their objectives, and um, we uh, we don't feel like there is a need to um, that there, that there should be any impact on the committee's work. They are moving moving in a, a a good, comfortable pace. Nothing feels rushed to them, um, and we still have time to work on it. So, from my perspective, in my opinion, I don't feel that uh, speaking primarily to the committee's role in this process, I don't feel like there needs to be any adjustments to the timeline as it relates to the committee. Um, and, once, and the committee is one role in this process. Once the committee's work is done, that recommendation is, is set, then it goes to the school board and the school board then takes it from there. And so, um, and I think there's gonna be some discussion about that, um, about how that part of the process may, may be modified. But from the perspective of the committee, I really feel confident that we are on schedule and on time uh, with the work that we've been doing. As I said, we're, we're only halfway. Uh, members of the public are uh, still, you know, they get anxiety when they see their zone, their, their neighborhood or community being moved. But, uh, you know, I can just, all I can say is that we're, everything is draft and we're still working through it. Um, the committee knows that they're not going to make everybody happy. Somebody is going to have to move. And some people uh, could be unhappy with the, process, with the way the results come out. But um, the committee's focused on doing the best they can in, in, in adhering to these criteria. They've met four times since May, um, many hours working on options and spent time in between meetings and emails and things like that. Uh, they reviewed four to five different variations of options so far. Um, started with two, two options per level and have expanded beyond that. Um, to four elementary and then five different middle and high school options they were looking at um, as of the last meeting. They've studied all the data and information to help support their, their decisions and, uh, as it relates to the criteria, enrollment, school enrollment capacity data, demographics, feeder pattern information, student impacts, and then ongoing input from the public. So trying not to leave any stone unturned throughout this process. And, I can't say it enough that the options are considered draft throughout this whole process. So nothing is written in pen or ink. Everything is, is I'd say, in pencil here, and things are still subject to change. New maps can and will be developed as the con committee continues their work and, and gets impact from the uh, public, as well as examining all the data and statistics. The public has uh, been providing in input throughout the process, and options have changed based on input from the public. Um, one thing that, to note is that we're, it's, it's not a popularity thing. If we, if we get 100 comments from one community, that doesn't mean that we need to make a change to the map. The only, it, sometimes one person may make a suggestion to a map that drives a change. Uh, the public's input is, uh, only drives change if it brings us closer to adhering to the criteria, the overall criteria. 
So, um, but it's the, the more comments we get, the better, so that we can make sure that we're aware of any, uh, any concerns the public has. Yeah, Matthew, if I could, I wanted to say I've been exploring the realignment site, and there's uh, one file on there that's called concerns or something from the public on the right side. It has the word concerns in it, and you can see all the options, how the committee is addressed, because we've received some of those emails how the committee has addressed that particular neighborhood's concern and, and what the options are. So. Yes, uh, we, I've been taking these, uh, the, the, feed, the thousands of emails and, and condensing them into a summary document that says a list of the subdivisions and the communities that, that the concerns are coming from. And as, as Ms. Furtenbaugh said, I'm color coding them so that the committee can, can sort of narrow it down and be able to focus on and see more in a summary form which has been helpful in the past, and this committee certainly finds it uh, valuable. And that will continue to be expanded on as we hear more. Um, so the committee has narrowed down to three draft options to present at the August 28th public information session. Um, they are, um, you could see the, 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 the picture on the screen is what we did that we call it uh, a sticker exercise, sometimes it's referred to as dot democracy. It's basically the committee was given two stickers, each committee member, <laughs> And they were told to put uh, two stickers on the two, uh, two options they felt best met the overall objectives and criteria. And this just helps. It really doesn't, it's not a vote, but it just helps to uh, facilitate the discussion and see if there's consensus. And um, the committee, after they saw this, we had a discussion about the options. Um, and they felt that um, you'll see option one only has three stickers, but they felt to take it because there were elements, take it to the public because there were elements of the maps that they liked. And, uh, and they wanted to get feedback from the public on specific elements of the map and see what the public says. So you'll see option one is going to be option A at the public meeting on the 28th. Option three is going to be option B. And then option 4B will be option C. So as of August 28th, there's going to be options A through C. And uh, we do we, we, we rename them just so, it's, so there's no confusion on, um, on the numbering and things like that. And uh, these are the options that, that the committee is prepared to share on August 28th uh, with, with, the, uh, with the public and to continue to, to continue to, as they continue to explore the, the various uh, work. Uh, the primary purpose of the August 28th public info session is to give an update to the public on the realignment committee's progress. Uh, still draft, subject to change. Um, where, they, is, where is that meeting? Uh, that meeting will be at J.M. Robinson High School at 6 p.m. I have some, some uh, details on that at the, uh, here in a couple of slides as well. Um, but everything is made public. Uh, everything that we share, everything, everything that the committee has in front of them has, has been made public. There's a realignment web page where all the meeting materials are, are linked on there. And uh, anybody can go there to review the materials. And I, I also encourage the board, if you guys want to go look and see some of the, the latest work the committee's done, you can go to any meeting, look at the PowerPoint on there, look at the materials, the handouts, the maps, uh, a lot of information um, available for, for the, the Cabarrus County community to, uh, to study. Um, as I said, the public are welcome to attend committee meetings as observers but not participants, so as long as they can... Uh, not impact the, the, pro the progress of the committee at the meetings, they're more than welcome to, to, to ob observe, and they've been great so far. Um, two public imp input sessions, information sessions coming up, like I said, the one on August 28th, and there's also another one November 7th. So, um, you know, there's, there's going to be two of these coming up uh, to, to keep giving updates to the public uh, on the draft options that are being considered. I wanted to give, uh, I don't know if I have a slide on this, but the public input information session, one of the things is um, sometimes you'll see these public information sessions where there's a microphone, people sign up and people get in, or they get in line to speak in, at the microphone. Um, that's not the format of, these, of this type of these meetings. This is really a data collection effort, and so the public is being invited to uh, see a presentation, very similar to this presentation I'm giving you now, to inform the public on the progress. And then once the presentation is done and we give an overview, we're inviting the public to come out to the, to the main, uh, to the, to the main uh, atrium area where maps, large maps will be posted, 
and committee members and staff and consultants will be around the maps to talk with committee to talk with the public and, and listen to any of their concerns. Um, so it's not an open mic type format. Um, the public is encouraged to fill out a survey, which will be uh, ready on, at the as of that meeting, and that'll be open for one or two weeks for the public to to, to participate in a survey that's different from the general feedback form that uh, it asks questions that align with the overall criteria. So. Um, it's a very effective way to get input. It allows people who couldn't make it to the meeting to participate as well, and it's, it's a very a proven way that, that we've done this in communities across the country. But the public so far, thousands of emails uh, have been received and comments. Um, they're constantly being reviewed, um, and uh, I, you know they really have been helpful. So uh, sometimes people are scared of the public and afraid of what people have to say, and uh, my perspective is the more the better. Uh, we encourage the public to give us input, um, knowing that they may not all be happy, but the, the more people that can participate and be knowledgeable of this, the better, in my opinion. Next steps, uh, August 28th, 6 to 8 p.m. at J.M. Robinson High School. Um, four, uh, four more meetings for the committee after that, um, which would be September 18th will be the next committee's uh, meeting. Uh, we'll summarize the public information session results and provide a report to the committee at that meeting, and they will continue to work on options development. Um, adjust adjustments could be made based on uh, the overall criteria. Um, and then the committee is continuing their work, and they're going to be back to the public on November 7th to give them another preview of the draft options, the further evol evolution of the options and maps on November 7th uh, to share with the public. So um, I think I've covered, uh, covered this pretty well. The online survey is a very important part of it uh, so that uh, although the public is telling us their comments and concerns around the maps, which we definitely want to hear, we're, I will align the committee to, to encourage them to fill out the survey. That's the most important thing is to put their input on paper in, in, via the survey, the online survey, that, uh, so we can all see a uh, summary of their, their comments. And that, with that, I'm, that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is this presentation available to us? The one I just provided? Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. I hope so. We do we, we, do we have? I didn't see it. Yeah, know. it's not in board docs, but we can get it in there. Mr. Walter, any questions? I, mean, I just got the presentation. We just sat through the presentation, so yeah. I'm still digesting. Yeah. So when does it go to the board? When does the board get this information? Uh, actually, that's in my kind of draft of a calendar here. Is December, or no, I'm sorry. Uh, the last committee meeting is December 4th, and so the presentation to the board will be 12, December 10th. And that's the presentation of what? The presentation of the recommendations uh, on behalf of the committee. And at that point, the committee's rec recommendation is handed to the board, and then and then that fa then that's when is the that the recommendation of the high school? Is that the recommendation of the elementary school? Is that all this big realignment with middle school? All everything three. Else? Everything? What what is what is what are we getting? It's elementary, middle, and high school. It's a full realignment plan that focuses on all three levels. So you'll have your full realignment plan to us by December. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. December 10th. And I think if you, um, I don't know how many of y'all have looked at the, the website yet, but, it anything. but is there it. is so much information. I just went out and played a little bit with it. Um, there's so much information to kind of watch the evolution so you can look at, um, you know, different options, like he was showing, click on the boxes. Okay. Um, so I, I would suggest everybody take a look at that. Um, and see what questions you have coming up from there. I mean, I've asked for a long time to see the GIS data, the, hard, the, the raw data, so I can look at it as well. Because, we, you know, we don't have to necessarily go on these blocks, but yeah, I, I, think mean, every I, I would like to, to see you know, that geo geocoded data as well. Yeah, I think you um, will see. Play with us maps, Rob. You will see everything. I understand, I understand that, but I would like to see the raw data so we can look at it as well. Yeah. 
my and and I'm sure you've taken it all in consideration because I know every time I seem to look at my computer we're seeing another new subdivision pop up and I would hope that this data would have all that into consideration because now that we've pushed out the school another year we we're not under the the big pressure we were under so you know now we can kind of get our breath and so you know you were under the everybody was under the deadline that we had to hurry hurry and get all this stuff done so now we we're not under that pressure so we're, I just want to make sure all our numbers are going to be good and so we're not pressured to have to hurry to get everything done so I want to make sure when we get those numbers and we get everything done that they are good so I know when we were doing one elementary school new subdivisions come in play and we had to expand that school before we even finished it mm -hmm. so we don't want to see us have to move something or change somebody because we did those numbers weren't good absolutely and so you're saying your figures are all going to be good so we're not yes. going to have to do that right yes, ma'am we are trying to be as proactive as possible in balancing the utilization and then also giving schools extra room to grow if they're in a high growth area or and if there's other schools that are forecast enrollments forecast to decline the committee's considering some of those they could even have them on the higher side of utilization impacting fewer students so that they can draw onto the trend so so they're being they're looking at current statistics but they're also being mindful of the future and with just with that in mind is trying to make sure that they hold as long as possible thank you yeah saying there's always those situations we can't control that families consolidate into one one household and those sorts of things but I think as close as the data will will allow us Dr. Kirk Are you? okay yeah <coughs> I reckon I'm surprised that the conclusions and the recommendations of this committee by December of this year will still be in play a year from now. And I, I'm, I'm impressed by that, that nothing's going to change in y'all's uh, recommendation. As a rookie, I don't understand how a year that a recommendation made this year is still good 12 months from now with all the growth that's happening. So what, am I, what am I missing? Well, it's, you know, the committee has been focused the whole time on, on the final, once everything is said and done, what is a boundary plan they can recommend that incorporates all the facility changes that are being planned. Um, so we have, from the start, we've been looking at that. Um, the latest, latest uh, changes to the board basically pushed into fall 2020 instead of 2019. Uh, from the committee's perspective, that doesn't have much of a much of an impact because they were looking at the out year anyway so if the committee were building a final uh, plan once everything was completed anyways um there there you know there is there is opening in fall 20 2020 um which is uh, one year beyond but the the usually these these plans hold for a good amount of time and uh we wouldn't expect them to have there to be substantial impacts we certainly hope you don't have to um, re do another realignment a year after you were approve a comprehensive realignment such as this so we try to be as proactive as possible to give schools that cushion to adapt to change new construction and things like that as much as possible and there's some certain things that we that we can't control if we don't know if a m major subdivision comes online things that aren't in our radar but um, but we're confident that that this that this recommendation that's going to be provided in December um, is best adheres to the overall criteria and is as proactive as possible. And um, you know once so so I, I'm confident that that that's going to be the result of this process. Thank you, Mr. Shimek. So I have a couple questions. Um, first, in the plan that comes out. Will that uh, realignment plan be a staged realignment or will it all occur as like a big bang and all the realignment happens in one year or does it happen in, in a, a, progre a, progre a progression sta status? Well, that, that's a good question. When it's, we normally align the, the realignment with the capital plan. So if you had construction occurring in subsequent uh, stages in uh, multiple years, it would be a phased in, it would be implemented in steps the main goal is to only move students once through this process. We don't want to move students to a school 
and then two years later or a year later when another addition or something gets built, move those students again. We want to try to move a community or student only once. Um, the way things have landed with uh, the capital plan here, everything falls on fall, uh, fall 2020. So the expectation in, um, in, from my perspective is that you could do um, a wholesale adjustment in that uh, beginning that year. And uh, you know you have some time too as well as, as Ms. Carpenter said, you have, you have another year so that you can plan for staffing and, and uh, notifying parents and, and get everything in line so that you can, uh, you can accomplish that. It, it is, a, it is a, a daunting task for a school uh, district to, to do a conference of redistrict, redistrict and realignment, but, um, but they, do it, they do it. I know Union County just did one that all three levels um, and they're beginning their implementation this year. So mo districts do do this and um, it's a lot to bite off, but, but it's, it's kind of a, it's an efficient way to do it. It's a necessary thing you have to do and in my opinion, might as well just get it done. And, um, but if districts want to phase it in, it's something that we could certainly help them with. The next question I have is, uh, obviously, in the out years, we had some other schools coming online later on in the, the plan. Will you be addressing, like, uh, we have a middle school that's scheduled in a couple years, like 2022 or 2023 or something like that, but uh, um, will there be enough in the plan to help guide us as we have to realign that school and, and, and blend it into the mix? Um, this this takes you to fall 2020, um, and with the assumption, the building assumptions that we have, the, the new construction and such, it doesn't include other future uh, capital improvements as part of this. So um, when those come online, which those are five, six, six years, or a good ways down the road still, um, those you would have you will have to take another look at your boundaries when those those uh, other facilities come online. Um, but we felt that uh, looking that far out with uh, as much change that occurs in Cabarrus County with the growth and, and everything that it may have been too proactive and you may end up causing more um, inefficiency mm -hmm. in looking that far out and move, maybe possibly moving student communities and having to move them again. And um, so, so, so we're not looking that far out as part okay. of this process. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I said I will send you uh, some suggested dates and see what uh, kind of comments you guys have back and forth on and whatnot um, to kind of work around having a new new board member seated. We may only have one new board member um, replacing Dr. Kirk's seat, but um, anything can happen. There's an election between now and then, so I want to make sure we don't have new members coming in, new member or members coming in who uh, are not familiar with the topic as well. So, Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Cropper. And now we will move on to um, board member training credit summaries. And I'll ask Dr. Kirk to lead us off with his recent training. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, even for those of us who are concerned about racial disparities in American systems and institutions, I must say that those who attended the two-day racial equity workshop were all challenged in our understanding of how racism remains alive and well, uh, advantaging some while harming others. The Racial Equity Institute's two-day training develops the capacity of participants to understand racism in its institutional and structural forms. I think the presenters were even-handed, moving from individual bigotry and bias expanding the scope of the workshop to present a historical, cultural, structural, and institutional analysis of racism, building our capacity to identify the root causes of disparity, and helping to establish goals and strategies based on that deeper understanding. It was a great two days, with about 35 of us or so, I think, uh, from many walks of life. We had law enforcement, health, education, and a lot of others. And we had a pretty eclectic group, a uh, pretty unique one, reflecting pretty much a blend of all the ethnic groups. There were five different ethnic groups represented, so a really healthy discussion, a lot of uh, self-reflection, and it was a good two days. Cannot speak highly enough of the REI workshop and one which invited a lot of self-examination. So thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity uh, to attend this powerful workshop. 
Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Um, and Ms. Carpenter. Okay. All right. I've got 49 hours uh, to tell you in 10 minutes about 49 <laughs> hours of education I got. Okay. But first of all, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. And uh, first of all, I think I will start uh, with uh, my uh, children welfare trauma training that I got. And that happened to be, as I told you earlier, I like to get what I can free. And this training happened to be seven hours of free training. Uh, and I would like to recommend this for other board members. If you, This was given to me here in Cabarrus County. And this was actual it was really, really good training. And uh, two, I was going to, uh, I do have the handouts that I, I received with this one. Um, and so if any of you would like uh, the actual, the trauma toolkit for educators, I do have that whole pamphlet uh, plus uh, the uh, uh, most all of the materials, and uh, so if you would like a copy of that, I can get her to make this for y'all if you would like this. Uh, but one of the things, uh, the issues for discussion, you know, many children in our community have been exposed to trauma. Most involved with the children welfare system have experienced trauma. The examples of trauma affect children's behaviors, development, and relationships. Those of us working with children have families have uh, opportunities to help reduce the short and long-term effects of trauma by understanding how trauma impact children and using trauma information uh, practices. And one of the things within this, they had a form, and it's called, they called it the ACE form, which is Advanced Children Childhood Experiences. And they kind of rate, uh, it was kind of a rating sheet, and they said if children have at least four or more of the ACE, or, or they are 32 times more likely to have problems. And they kind of use that as a rating uh, sheet. And it talks about the traumas and how many different trauma type things uh, children have. And we discussed, the, they were showing brain diagrams and how. Uh, a young child's brain develops differently than a older child, and it got very technical. And it says how uh, how uh, children deal with trauma differently, and uh, the effects of trauma exposure, how uh, it can change uh, uh, the disposition of a child, their behavior control, uh, their development, uh, how trauma affects them. And like I say, this was a very in-depth type of uh, program. And the long-term effect of childhood trauma, it leads to high risk or destructive coping behavior. These behaviors place children at high risk for a range of serious mental and physical uh, problems ranging from alcoholism drug abuse, depression, suicide attempts, uh, sexual uh, transmitted diseases due to high-risk activities with multiple uh, partners, uh, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, uh, and uh, liver diseases. Now, again, I'm just hitting on some of the high points. Again, this was a very uh, a seven-hour course, so there was a, a lot involved with this. Many children in our community have been exposed to trauma. Most involve, involvement with children welfare, welfare system have experienced trauma. The experience of trauma affects children's behavior, development, and relationships. Those of us working with children and families have an opportunity to help reduce the short and long-term effect, uh, effects of trauma by understanding how trauma impacts children and using trauma information practices. And basically what this was, this was attended by our, some of our teachers and principals, and it's just telling us that we see these children, and when we see these children kind of withdraw or maybe their behavior, they have been doing great in school, and all of a sudden they stop. Something's happened to these children, and we just have to see this. 
some type of trauma. Maybe something's happened at home. But this, this course kind of told you to kind of look for some of these things. And again, if you have an opportunity, this was a great learning tool. And like I say, it went really in depth. So this is one of them. We're going to put this to the side. Now we're going to change gears here. Uh, next thing that uh, I attended was, and again, this one made me very, very proud of Cabarrus County. I went to the North Carolina Association of School Administrators. And the very first thing I found, man, it was great. Cabarrus County, we're great. I have to... I'm very proud of us. I found out we were doing a lot of great things, and we, we're already ahead of the game on uh, uh, a lot of things. But this was uh, uh, the safe, uh, School Safety uh, Summit, and we did. We were, we were already doing a lot of things, and I am so proud of our system. I mean, we are ahead of the game and doing a lot of other things. We were the first in the state to have... Uh, have uh, school nurses. We were the first in the state to have SRAs in all our schools. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but we were the first, in, and, and here we were to have uh, social workers have, have the team in place to help. I mean, we were, we have, we've stepped up. Safety is one of our first things that we, we are. We are really we, we work very hard to make our schools safe, and we are continuing to work. We're always doing that. But we have, we have been, uh, I cannot say how we always are stepping up to the plate when, you know, when, it, when people weren't going after those money for the SROs, we stepped up. We were one of the first ones to go after the state funds to get that. Um, I am going to pass out some of the stuff, if you would. I have made some packets right now for each board member, uh, if you would pass these out. This has got the agenda for this. Also, it has got, um, it shows the uh, legislative uh, the monies that are available for the legislation this year, the grant monies that's being available, but I made a packet for each of you. Uh, this conference was a wonderful conference. Uh, we, we hit on a couple things. One of the speakers that we had uh, was the uh, superintendent that uh, was the superintendent at Newtown uh, at Sandy Hook. He was a past, and he was excellent, uh, but he was a speaker there, and he has been asked to speak at many conferences, but he was excellent, and he was talking about lessons learned uh, that they learned from the sh shooting at Sandy Hook, and one of the things that he mentioned was uh, the responsibility of the Board of Education. And he fostered the di uh, district culture that makes students success and well-being priority. But he says the responsibilities is develop and maintain policy and procedure for the district based on local needs and uh, requirements. He said uh, adopt, advocate, and oversee the district's budget, support, and work efficiently with the super. Uh, superintendent and uh, communicate with other elected officials and community members. He said that's one of the things that needs to be done with the uh, board, but he said after the incident at Sandy Hook, he said he gathered up all the teachers and all the people involved in the incident, and he said, he asked them, what did we learn from this, or what can we take away from this incident that took so many lives and changed their community? And one of the things that, that's really different, you know, they tore down the school completely and they rebuilt it. Now at Sandy Hook, when those, that school is completely enclosed, and when they go, the students go out on the playground, they go out with armed guards when they go out to play. Now, to me, you, you hate to see that with a kindergartner having to go out with an armed guard to play on the playground. Uh, but uh, that's what they do. But from what they learn from that situation is that every door must be locked from the inside. 
they had to, at Sandy Hook when that incident took place, they had to go and lock the doors. And one of the things that he made a point of telling us was about two of their teachers. And this is something that really stuck with me. He did have two teachers. One of the teachers was she took all her students and took the students and took them and put them all into a little ba the little bathroom and put them all into that little bathroom and locked that door. But that saved the life of every one of those students and she locked that those students in that little bitty bathroom but that saved the life of all those students the other teacher was one as this gunman was shooting she heard the gunman's gun jam and when she heard him trying to get the gun unjammed she thought fast enough to get her students out and got them out and run across. She knew that her classroom was going to be the next classroom he went to, but she thought quick enough to get those students out and got, took them out the back door and got them out, and that way she saved their lives. But the next thing was every window must be numbered. This, again, is something that we are looking into and have been looking into, but numbered from the outside so they know what the numbers are. Every staff member, follow your lead with a high-yield, no-cost mentoring program. Every school building is immediately, uh, um, immediately understood by at least one safety officer, Every month you hold a meeting with police chief. And these are some of the things they learned. Every superintendent ensured their board that all staff understand a safety plan. And these are some of the things that, he, that they learned during that time. And as I told you about those two teachers, but this was his, his, his presentation was just wonderful. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you as I gave you that information about all the programs we have applied for these grants, the other, the last thing on this one, like I say, you see all the wonderful things, but we did have a presentation by our wonderful Amy Louder and she did an outstanding job and it was talking about our uh, our, about the, the, the thing that we have in place with our, our, which we do an outstanding job of, is having our team of our student, our school counselors, school psychologists, and our school social worker team that's, that's also with our school nurse. They bring in our school nurse and our school SRO, their team that we have in place. And she did an outstanding job. And, uh, but, uh, uh, she gave, told them all about that, and uh, she did an outstanding job with that. But uh, they, the, the whole conference was really good, but it showed how, how far we are doing and what we're doing in Cabarrus County being so outstanding. Uh, real quickly, that conference was great. I'm going to just touch briefly on what we did with SRO. I'm sorry, I'm trying to do it as quickly as possible, but with the SOR conference, it was really good. Uh, we basically, most of all of that was on the uh, safety element, talking about, uh, well, we, we talked on many different things, but basically it was talking about uh, the, the uh, uh, the different incidents that have taken place across the uh, United States. And with uh, one of the questions I have, and I bet I know one of our members know this, but does anyone know besides, now, Dr. Kirk, you can't answer this, but does anyone know besides Dr. Kirk, does any of our other members know, when was the first school shooting? Does anybody else of our board members know when was the first school shooting? Any other board member? No. Huh? Everybody says Columbine. 
No, yeah, it was way before Columbine. Well, let's see it the no, he does know. We, we, no, the first school shooting, and this is a little, the first school shooting was November the 12th, 1840 at the University of Virginia. So everybody that always says, they think it's something that just recently, this has been going on for quite a while. And the first time you saw a number of fatalities was in August the 1st, 1966, when you saw 17 fatalities and 31 injuries. And this was in, at the University of uh, Texas. So you didn't start seeing a lot of them. And you see most of this, all, even back in 1840, it was due to bullying back that far. And, and so, the, and I'm bringing this up now because most of the time during this conference we talked about, about all these sessions, what most of the time these shooters were, most of the time they're loners, they've been bullied, and I'm bringing this up now because school's getting ready to start. You are going to be receiving a student handbook. Parents, please read your student handbook. There's a section on it, and it's, it's talking about there's, you're signing that there's a, a sheet that says you're signing that there's, there's a form on bullying. If you hear or your child comes home and says he's been bullying or somebody says there's been bullying, there's a form that you can fill out. Please go to the principal's office, fill out that form and get it and fill that out. This is, this is very important, and so please do that. Another thing that we, we learned or we were talked about, we talked about drills. They're very important. All staff, everybody's going to be going through that. That's very important. You need to stay calm during the uh, drills. Those are very important. The other thing is it talked about shootings, not just school shootings. Most of them happen in buildings and about escaping and getting out. I don't know how many of you, without even looking, does, how many of you know how many exits are in this building right now? You probably didn't look. Most people will go out the same way they came in. That's the reason so many people lost their lives at the Pulse nightclub because they all tried to get out the same exit. You should always be aware of your, your surroundings when you go to a grocery store, to the theater, anywhere. Look at all your exits. That could save your life, save your child's life. So always be aware of your situation. She's saying, please hurry up, Carol. <laughs> we uh, still have a lot more to go through. But, but please be aware of your situation because it could save your life. Uh, so please be aware of that. Stay calm during your drills, whether it be a safety, whether it be a, a blackout drill, whether it be a fire drill. But be, please be aware. Again, I could go on for days, but uh, if you want any of the handouts, again, please uh, just, okay. is that? That's the next one. Is that an extra one? Uh, I do have the other ones. I'll be more than happy to share the one with the, uh, from the guy from uh Sandy Hook, uh, but I'll make copies for you. Again, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I could go on for days, but thank you for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Carpenter, and good idea, Mr. Walter, to have these little uh, debriefs. Uh, so we will now go on to uh, our comments area and a, a few notes uh, from myself, um, a couple upcoming events. Um, on Saturday for the uh, WSLC Nine School Tools Project, uh, the Rotary Club and other volunteers will be accepting donations at Walmart Concord Commons on Highway 29 uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. along with the fire department will be there as well with the, Concord Sa or the fire safety house um, and a fire truck so to interest the youngsters. Um, on Sunday, August 26th, we invite the community to join us at the dedication of the new Royal Oaks Elementary School at 2 p.m. Uh, and that is, uh, again, Sunday, August 26th, 2 p.m. Uh, at Royal Oaks at 608 Dakota Street in Kannapolis. And the third item, uh, we will be dedicating the new Hickory Ridge Elementary School on Tuesday, August 28th at 6 p.m.
That is all. Dr. Ladder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to say we're two weeks away from the start of the 2018-2019 school year for most of our Cabarrus County students. Our early colleges started last week and our year-round school started last month. We are very excited about the new school year and look forward to welcoming students and families during open house next week on August 22nd and August 23rd. You can find new school year information on the Back to School website, which is accessible from our district website, um, www.cabarrus.k12.nc.us. This week we are also welcoming our new teachers. This morning we welcomed about 90 new teachers that the HR department um, put on to kind of host and begin the orientation process for them. Dr. Hill spoke to that group and did a great job. And as Ms. Jones said earlier, um, Ms. Colbreth um, did an outstanding job this morning with that group. And I really need to steal some of her material for integrating our strategic plan because she did a great job with that. So she, she really um, was outstanding today. Um, one of the highlights of the week will be the new teacher luncheon hosted by the Cabarrus Regional Chamber. We're grateful to the chamber and the many businesses and organizations that are participating in this year's event. We want to say congratulations to Mount Pleasant High School student Mason Saunders, who was named the National Masonry Champion at the Skills USA National Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, earlier this summer, and we look forward to recognizing him at a future board meeting. We also extend congratulations to the Exceptional Children's Department, which recently received a $76,000 grant from Cardinal Innovations Healthcare through the Community Reinvestment Initiative. The grant will be used for FM hearing technology for students with hearing impairment and auditory processing disorders. This is the final week for the summer meals program. Children 18 and younger are eligible and no identification or reservations are required. Please visit www.cabarrus.k12.nc.us slash free summer meals for a list of the sites. Parents also are reminded that applications for free and reduced lunch meal benefits during the school year are now being accepted. Apply at www.lunchapplication.com. Contact our school nutrition department at 704-260-5550 if you have any questions. Also want to say that our district offices and schools have new telephone numbers. With that conversion, the new main number for the district is 704-260-5600. You can find a complete list of the new district and school phone numbers on our website. And lastly, just want to say how we look forward to welcoming everyone back to school on Monday, August 27th. Yes, Ms. Carpenter. I do have one, one thing I'd like to bring up. Cabarrus County Fair is coming. <laughs> I, I, I would like to remind everybody that Cabarrus County Fair is coming September the 7th through the 15th, but you can enter uh, if you go to CabarrasCountyFair.com, uh, you have to have your entries in by August the 22nd by 12 p.m. And the reason I'm bringing this up, children can enter uh, ages 5 to 8. They get a dollar per entry, you know, for entering things. But you do have to have your entry forms in by August the 22nd by 12 o'clock. But that's a dollar, and uh, but I just want to let you know. When do they deliver their items then? Uh, you have to drop them off by September the 4th and 5th. You okay. drop them off. But you have to have that form in by August 22nd because you can, you got to have that form in. Uh, that's why I was mentioning that. But you go to CabarrasCountyFair.com to bring up that form. That brings up the catalog and everything okay. So because it's all online. Uh, but I just wanted to bring that up because you've got to have that entry form in because you can't enter them if you don't have that form. Yeah. Uh, but that's a way you can get a dollar. Uh, <laughs> and then there's other categories. Uh, then if you're above eight, then you have to go to the other categories. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of fun. And so come bit, it's the only place you can see a pig chase a cookie <laughs> and get roast corn in a foot long. So come to the fair. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I know my children always enjoyed um, entering things in the fair. So they would take a 4-H class during the summer, and then they would enter it in whatever category. And it was great fun to get ribbons and things and collect those all the years. It is. So. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, we're now moving to our guest speaker section. In accordance with Board Policy 2310, a part of each business meeting will be set aside for citizens to address the board through public comment. Each speaker will receive three minutes to pre present comments. Sign-up will be available 30 minutes before the meeting begins. 
Speakers must sign up with the Board of Clerk no later than the normal start time of the regular scheduled monthly business meeting. And there are additional details about the policy and procedure in the agenda. Mindy, do we have any guest speakers tonight? Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move to the consent agenda. Board members, we have 8.01, the approval of the uh, items placed on the consent agenda at our work session on August 13th, 2018. Do I have the motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Mr. Shoemaker made the motion. Dr. Kirk made the second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes 6-0. Thank you. Now move to the action agenda. The first item is to adopt the budget, re budget res resolution <laughs> for 2018-19. We'll have Ms. Putz come up to share any additional information. Yes. Um, thank you. I only received one question since the last meeting regarding the budget, and that question was regarding uh, DPI's projections uh, versus where we currently are. And so it is um, too early to, to know until children show up on the first 10 days. We really don't have a good idea. Um, DPI's projection was 33,241. Um, our internal projection... You said 32,000? 33,241. 241. Okay. Our internal projections were 33,125. And McKibben's projections are 32,841. That's a span of an increase from anywhere from 340 students to 740 students. So we hope to fall just short of the 740. <laughs> 99 short exactly is when I get to keep my money from DPI. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll look forward to updates on that uh, in our September meeting. In the September meeting is yes. when we can provide a better update. Yes. Okay, any other outstanding budget questions? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the budget resolution for 2018-2019 uh, as presented. So moved. Second. Dr. Kirk made the motion. Uh, Mr. Shoemaker made the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Motion passes 5-1. Is there anything you wanted to share, Mr. Powell? Yes, I, did, I just don't agree with the, um, what is it, 0.25% increase in the teacher supplement. I just feel like uh, we could look through the budget and find more uh, to do for teachers. Okay. But that's not part of our process, so that's okay. I understand. Okay, I even understanding what Ms. Klutz provided last week regarding the county appropriating over a million dollars to cover the state matching raises and increasing the supplement uh, on that 6% uh, increase as well. So, I have a good understanding of okay. exactly where the money's coming from and where we're wasting it within our district, and I wish we would look at some of that waste, but we're not, and that's okay. I understand. Okay. Um, and I would say if you would like to join the budget committee uh, next year, that might be an option. The budget committee only looks at the expansion budget. There's no process in place to look at existing um, expenditures. Yeah, sometimes there is give and take, though, having been at those meetings, saying we're going to reduce this in order to accomplish something else. I've participated a number of times um, in years past. I haven't done it in several years because it's it's a, a tremendous commitment for only the expansion budget. Um, mm -hmm. But if there's ever a, a committee to examine um, a variety of other budget items that are not a part of the expansion budget, I would be all for mm -hmm. it. But to this point, there hasn't been one. Well, perhaps um, write up your suggestions and get them to Ms. Klutz when, and the other board members. Do we do, when do we do that? When do we look at a zero-based budget, look through the whole budget? I mean, is that the responsibility of the board to do that? or is it? No, I will tell you that um, I asked some years ago, i am say maybe 10 years ago, that we look at that when we were in a critical uh, situation with the decline in the economy and whatnot. So it probably was right at 10 years ago. So we, um, have, we haven't looked at the full budget in 10 years. No, but let me tell you what, what happened out of that is that so much of our budget is what I'll call, and Kelly, you can correct me here, but mandated items. So there wasn't a lot of fluff that we could make decisions on. We were down to 
$6,000 decisions, $15,000 decisions. There weren't enough of those to stop um, and completely zero base it, not when you took out the mandated items. I think it so. would probably be worthwhile at least looking at it once again, even if there aren't, aren't any, I think. For education yeah, purposes, the rest yeah. of us should probably be educated on what all those items are. Mm -hmm. And um, if the board would love to do that, I would love to spend some time with you. Um, but it's going to take an extreme commitment and a large amount of time. Um, it already takes, what, four, day, four full days for the uh, committee? To do a zero base, you, you're looking at multiple weeks, mm -hmm. probably two to three minute weeks constant commitment. Yeah, to build it back up from zero. To build it back zero, up from zero. And you're going to need staff input, school level input, teacher input. Um, all, you, you need to think about how much time you're asking. Already, uh, we don't want to pull our teachers out of classrooms right now for our three to four day budget process. So do you want to bring principals, assistant principals, teachers, committee members here for three to four weeks, 40 hours a week to achieve that goal? Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to answer. I'm just saying there's something you need to think about if that's mm -hmm. the direction that you want me to go in. Well, I appreciate um, that input. Maybe that's something we should discuss at our retreat then. I'm here. I work 40 to 50 hours, of, 60 hours a week, so <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. If you want to make the commitment and come, yeah. I'll be here. And that's the key. The board needs to make the commitment yes. too if you want to pursue that. So. I'm not or, or we could just, <laughs> or we could just take a poll and we could find probably $2 million worth of of fluff to cut out, but that's okay. Maybe that's a different discussion. No, Mr. Pice, I sincerely want you to provide to the board and to Ms. Klutz your suggestions so that there is some substance behind it that can be looked into because you were an employee, so you may have ideas. Uh, that's exactly right. That might be um, a pretty good insight. But yeah. okay. o over the past three years, I've given lots of um, suggestions and we've uh, voted on lots of fluffy things, and that's okay. I, I understand. Okay. I, I didn't want a discussion. You wanted to discuss yeah. it, and that's fine. But no, I would just, I'm, I really would, I would like to see your ideas. I would rather put money in teachers' pockets than to pay for lots of um, just kind of fluffy expenditures that we go through. And we can, <laughs> if, you, if you want to know, I would certainly be willing to discuss that. Yeah, I, 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 think I really would, just because I had the first. interest in the zero base, and I saw all of the... Um, mandated items, the legalese behind that you cannot move CTE money to EC and vice versa. There were so many things that that are legal decisions almost um, mandated by DPI or other agencies, federal agencies, um, that it ended up we were whittled down to very small amounts that we could impact. And we did do some things, but it was very small in the end. So. Okay, we'll go to 9.02, approval of policy 3225, 4310, 7320 on second reading, and this is the uh, technology responsible use policy. Welcome, Deputy Superintendent Reimer and Ms. Susan Burns. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is on action tonight, so uh, Mr. Walter, our board member, did have a question about it, sent that question in. It is something that uh, the committee, the policy committee, did look at as well as uh, policy 7335 uh, as asked to be consistent between those two policies and the committee's recommendation was to, to approve as written. Mr. Walter, any additional questions or comments? I, mean, I don't object to the entire policy and I don't object to the, change, the recent changes. What I don't feel comfortable with is I don't think it's consistent with what we're doing is uh, there's a section on employees. There's a se I guess it's the second sentence of the first paragraph under on page five, and we've had these discussions before, but it says employees may not use personal websites, personal email accounts, or personal social media to communicate regarding school-related matters or attempt to communicate with other employees or students about school-related matters. Um, I think that hurts collaboration. I think uh, we have a lot of folks that are using social media out there. I just don't think it's consistent with today's times. So that's why I'm not comfortable with the policy, and that's why I'm objecting to it. But again, that's my opinion, my interpretation. So. Any other comments? 
Okay, I'll take a motion uh, to approve policy 3225-4312-7230 on second reading. Second. Mr. Shoemaker made the motion. Dr. Kirk made the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 So that's uh, four. Any opposed? No. Nay. No. Okay. So the motion or policy is approved with a motion of four to two. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have uh, uh, agenda item 9.03, the approval of the school nutrition program procurement plan. Ms. Don Baker, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Last week I presented the school nutrition procurement plan. Um, to date, I have not received any additional questions from the board members. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the school nutrition program procurement plan? I'll make a as motion. Presented? To, I'll make a motion to approve the plan. Thank you, Mr. Walter. That. Mr. Walter made the motion. Mr. Shoemaker made the second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes 6-0. So that was painless. We yes. get all the questions out the first week of the, we of the work session as planned. As planned. Uh, next, we have agenda item 9.04, the approval of the food supplies, milk, and chemical bids. Um, Madam Chairman, to date, um, I have not received any additional questions from the board members. Okay. Board members, any questions this evening? I'll if make a motion that we approve the food supplies, milk, and chemical bids. Uh, as second. as presented in the agenda. As presented in the agenda. Okay. Sorry. Okay, Mr. Shoemaker made the motion. Dr. Kirk made the second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion passes 6-0. Thank, Thank you. you. See, all the hard prep work on the prep pays off in the end. Next, we have 9.06, beginning teacher support. And we will have, uh, is Ms. Wood here tonight? She is not. She's okay. been busy all day with our new teachers. So Okay, very good. I'm here. So welcome back. I have so, not had any questions from board members, and neither has Angie Woods. So we have it here before you tonight for approval. Okay. Any questions or comments? What data do you look at with regard to this program? I'm sorry? What data are you looking at to, with regard to this program, how successful it is? What do, you, what do you look at? So what data are we looking at mm -hmm. when, with may, regards yeah. to the, well, we have a peer review process that's utilized within the region, um, Mr. Walter, and so that's one thing we look at. We look at teacher turnover. Uh, we look at our mentor program, and Angie works with our lead mentors in the district as well as the mentors at all of the schools. So it's a lot of qualitative data as opposed to quantitative. But you are looking at turnover rate. How is the turnover with the... The, the newer how is our t turnover re with regards to the newer teachers? You know, I'll have to look at that to give you an exact number. Okay. Just curious to see how okay. effective the program is. I'd rather look at it and give you an exact which, number which than is, to guess Which is tonight. fine. I'm just, again, seeing how effective our program okay. is with our new teachers. I know one comment that I've heard consistently um, when I've been able to go to the luncheon is that um, some of the teachers who are new were new in another district at one time or another couple of districts and they were never treated as well um, as coming to Cabarrus County. So that was encouraging and uh, Ms. Colbert, do you have any insight into that? <laughs> insight on the induction program or just how you've seen new teachers coming to your school? I and think the mentor program is hugely important. Mm -hmm. I think that that definitely keeps teachers teaching. And right now in North Carolina, we have a major teacher shortage, and we need to keep teachers teaching for yeah. sure. So that the starting encouragement is helpful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. And you've you've been a mentor, mentor as well. Have you been a mentor part um, of? Program? Yeah, I was a mentor, and then I was the lead mentor at Urban. So I kind of ran the program, but also worked with one individual teacher, and we met weekly and. It just is that support that beginning teachers need. It's a really hard job starting out. You don't know really anything. So it's very important to have that support. Yeah. 
Mr. Walter, would you like to make the motion that the beginning teacher support plan be approved? Sure, I'll make the motion that we approve the beginning <laughs> teacher support plan. See, when you're the last one to comment, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Is that Dr. Kirk? Made yes, this. Yes. What's that? <laughs> second the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, that motion passes 6 0. Now we will go back um, so that we have an opportunity to read our minutes on the agenda. It is still shown as 5.01. So we'll just pause here for a moment so we can catch up on uh, reading these. Are we pausing the recording or are we recording silence? Okay. Aren't they just watching? Put some background music on her. Yeah. <laughs> right, background music. Or some, Je three, some, Je three some Jeopardy music would here. probably be good. Mr. Swartz, you have reviewed these already? Okay. What's that? And you're okay with all of that? <laughs> okay. Members, are you ready to vote yet? Yes. <laughs> Just give me a moment to go back. Okay, I will take a motion uh, to approve the minutes of the uh, meetings, the business meeting on June 11th, 2018, the June 28th board meeting, and the July 9th board meeting. So move, Madam Chair. Okay, Dr. Kirk made the motion in a second. I'll second. Okay. 
Mr. Walter made a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes 6-0. Uh, now it is time uh, for us to get being in closed session. We'll thank our viewing audience and those present here tonight. Um, I will take a motion that the board convene in closed session pursuant to General Statute 143.318.11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body which privilege is hereby acknowledged, and pursuant to General Statute 143.318.11A6, to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee, or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge, or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee, to review personnel recommendations, and pursuant to General Statute, 143-318-11A5 to instruct staff regarding the terms of potential purchase of real property. So moved. Motion approved by uh, Mr. Shoemaker, seconded by Dr. Kirk. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So the board is now in closed session. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>